Chapter 7. To examine and report on earlier investigations and inquiries done on and into the death of Dr. Walter Rodney. Terms of Reference 5. The four investigations which are relevant to Terms of Reference 5 are as follows. 1. The inquest held by Coroner Edwin Pratt from February 4th to 15th, 1988. 2. The post-mortem report of Dr. H. R. M. Johnson, a consultant pathologist and reader in forensic medicine who was attached to the Forensic Medicine Unit, Department of Morbid Anatomy, St. Thomas Hospital, Medical School, London, England, dated June 30th, 1980. 3. An investigative report dated July 23rd, 1980, from Dr. Frank Skoos, forensic scientist at the Home Office Forensic Science Laboratory, England. 4. A report issued by the International Commission of Jurists, ICJ, dated March 2nd, 1995, the members of that body having visited Guyana from March 14th through March 19th, 1995. It is common ground that Dr. Rodney met his death in unusual circumstances. In the words of the Coroner's Act, Chapter 4-5 of the Laws of Guyana, it was an unnatural death warranting and holding of an inquest with urgency. However, despite the fact that Senior Superintendent James testified that an inquest is normally held within two months of death, in the case of Dr. Rodney, it was held almost eight years after his death. No explanation was provided for this inordinately long delay, but the police file did reveal that the request for the inquest was made by ASP Gentle to the coroner on the 26th of October, 1987. There were significant material irregularities in the inquest itself, as the reports of the foreign experts, Drs. Johnson and Scoos, were not tendered into evidence at the inquest or the trial of Donald Rodney. Additionally, Sergeant Trenton Roach was a witness at the inquest, but was not called at the trial of Donald Rodney. He conducted an important examination of the electronic equipment, which consisted of three domestic radio receivers, one very high-frequency monitor, four walkie-talkies, two Midland and two Lafayette. They were all seized from No. 40 Russell Street, Charleston, which was Gregory Smith's former residence. Since he was carrying out his examination on June 14, 1980, the day after Rodney was killed, he thought that this was WPA equipment. However, after his examination was concluded, he wrote a statement of his findings and appended his signature thereon. Notwithstanding the foregoing, the typed and unsigned statement, which was produced to the commission from the police file, contained material discrepancies and differed from the handwritten note found by Sergeant Roach on the monitor which had read, Remember to work on the 14th, and then written over the 4 was the number 3. Both the date and month on type statement produced said, Remember to work on 14th January 1980, but the number 4 was overwritten on the number 2. The significance of the discrepancies in this paragraph was intended to distort the record as it relates to Smith's role on June 13, 1980. The other significant discrepancies were the date of the statement given as June 27, 1980, and the date of the signature listed as 30th of June, 1980. Sergeant Roach strongly denied that the information on the typed record was correct. Included in the file was a typed document signed by ASP Gentle, dated 88-02-03, which stated that he and a party of policemen executed a search warrant at Forte Russell Street and seized the equipment earlier referred on June 19th. 1980. This, however, was another attempt to cover up the true identity of the killer by the police in relation to Dr. Rodney's death. Sergeant Roach maintained that his examination was on the day after Rodney died. Another attempt to hide evidence by the police arises from the fact that they never disclosed or made public the reports of the foreign experts which provide forensic support to show that Dr. Rodney was murdered. The stated position of the government soon after Dr. Rodney's death was that it would make all forensic reports related to his death public. They never did. The ICJ's report alluded to a number of shortcomings by the police in their investigation into the death of Dr. Rodney. Having examined very closely the evidence put before us, we, the Commission, agree 
that there were several shortcomings. Captain Govaya was a lieutenant in the GDF at the time. He voluntarily and freely admitted that on the morning of June 14, 1980, he flew his aircraft 8RGER from Tamari to Kokwani. On that flight, he took Gregory Smith, his girlfriend Gwendolyn Jones and their children. He left at 9.08 a.m. and arrived at Kokwani Airstrip at 9.57 a.m. At the time, Captain Jerry Govaya testified that he had not realized that the adult male passenger was Gregory Smith. He claimed that a few days later he saw a photograph in the Catholic Standard and he then realized that he had flown the same person to Kokwani. Given the chain of command, he did not fly that aircraft of his own volition, but had been instructed by his superiors so to do. He further told us that his commanding officer in 1980 was Lieutenant Colonel Godwin McPherson, but he assumed that in June 1980, his commanding officer was Captain Barker. Captain Jerry Govaya testified at that time of the events. The state controlled the flow of news, implying that he had not seen or heard anything on the government-controlled media that Gregory Smith was wanted in connection with the death of Walter Rodney. Captain Jerry Govaya's arrival at Kokwani on June 14, 1980, with Gregory Smith and his family did not go unnoticed. Several witnesses who lived and worked at Kokwani saw the GDF aircraft 8RGER at the time Captain Jerry Govaya said he landed. These Kokwani witnesses were 1. Averill Bourne, aged 38 years old, being the reputed wife of Robert Van Kunten, who lived at Kokwani Park, Barbies River. Her witness statement is dated July 16, 1980. 2. Joel Southwell, a supernumerary constable with Guyana Mining Enterprise Limited at Kokwani and dated July 15, 1980. 3. Robert Van Kunten, a corporal of attached to Guyana Mining Enterprise Security Department at Kokwani who lived on the security compound with his reputed wife, Avril Bourne, and family and dated July 14, 1980. 4. Anita Thom a supernumerary constable employed by the Guyana Mining Enterprise Limited at Kokwani, her witness statement and dated July 15, 1980. 5. Egerton Causeway, a supernumerary constable attached to the security department of the Guyana Mining Enterprise Limited at Kokwani and dated July 15, 1980. The witness gave signed statements to Sergeant Sayago. What is significant is that of the five witnesses who saw Captain Govaya and Smith and his family on June 14, 1980, three of them also saw when his aircraft arrived on June 17, 1980. They all stated that they say his aircraft land at about 9.24 a.m. on that day and left at 10.05 a.m., taking on board Gregory Smith alone. On that very day, Captain Govaya returned to Tamari at 11.36 a.m. When that account was put to him, he denied that he flew Gregory Smith from Kokwani to Naikiri, Suriname. In attempting to explain the destination of his flight, he told the commission that he could not recall based on his memory. However, on perusing his pilot's logbook, it was clear to him that he left Tamari, went to Takama, and returned to Tamari on June 17, 1980. On the evidence before the commission, we find that Gregory Smith was a passenger on the said aircraft on June 14, 1980 and June 17, 1980. More importantly, Captain Gavaya admitted that the time stated in his pilot's logbook was sufficient for him to have gone to Kukwani and take Gregory Smith to Naikiri, provided that all governmental approval was granted. On the evidence, there is clearly no conflict between the Kukwani witnesses and Captain Jerry Govaya with respect to the movement of Gregory Smith on June 14, 1980. There were also statements in the police file from Gregory's younger brother, Aubrey Smith, stating that he saw Gregory in GDF uniform and confirmed that Gregory Smith was enlisted in the GDF. Also, Pamela Bihari gave full details of Gregory Smith's being in the GDF, where he lived and with whom. Miss Bihari knew these details because she had lived in the same house as Gregory, his wife, and his children. The police file also had a witness statement from Joanne Melvin, a former civil servant who was made a diplomat and was posted abroad shortly after Rodney's death. 
She had described Gregory as her fiancé, two photographs of him in her locked desk drawer at work. These photographs were removed without her knowledge, and she has never seen them again. In light of all the facts, matters, and events set out in the above paragraphs, we conclude that any well-functioning police force would have pursued all leads in order to locate and bring Gregory Smith in for questioning, at least as the prime suspect in the killing of Dr. Walter Rodney. On the facts, we draw the inevitable inference that there was a collaborative effort by agents of the state to conceal and keep Gregory Smith from the long arms of the law. There were too many unexplained events which point irresistibly to that conclusion. A. The swift removal of Gregory Smith, his girlfriend Gwendolyn Jones, and their children from Tamiri to Kukwani by Captain Govaya on a GDF aircraft on June 14, 1980, with the approval of the High Command of the GDF. B. The removal of Gregory Smith from Kukwani on June 17, 1980, from Kukwani to Naikeri, Suriname, or some other destination by the GDF aircraft. We rely on this from the statement provided by the Kukwani constable on the police file. C. The sudden disappearance of Gwendolyn Jones and their children and removal to New York, United States of America. D. The unauthorized removal of Gregory Smith's two photographs from the locked desk drawer of Joanne Melvin, coupled with her immediate promotion as a diplomat in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. To this must be added her posting on July 6, 1980 to New York and later ended up in Toronto, Canada. She subsequently disappeared. E. Denial by the Chief of Staff of the Army at the time, Major General Retired Norman McLean, that Gregory Smith was a member of the GDF at any time or a serving member of the maritime branch of the GDF. F. The unexplained disappearance of Gregory Smith's personal files with the GDF, coupled with the unexplained disappearance of the WPA files 1-7 to inclusive, kept by the special branch of the police force in its secret registry, was, in our judgment, deliberate, and we so find. G. Gregory Smith being allowed to return to Ghana at least twice without being arrested or even stopped. H. The granting to Gregory Smith of two inconsistent birth certificates with different and contradicting particulars and facilitating him with passports, especially Guyana passport number 0890057, issued on May 21, 1999, authorized by a commissioner of police and Chief Immigration Officer of Guyana, Ms. Laurie Lewis. In this context, we note the following. I. A true copy of the extract of the birth registrar of District Georgetown for the year 1964 under the hand of the registrar dated 2014-1104, which showed that at entry number 99, the child, Gregory Smith, was born on June 5, 1946, at Public Hospital Georgetown, whose name at birth was William, father's name given as Cecil Smith, mixed, of 64 Hunter Street, mother's name given as Anita Smith, former Berry of 64 Hunter Street. This, we conclude, is an accurate and true record of Gregory Smith's birth particulars. J. A true copy of the extract of the birth registrar of District 8 Plaisance for the year 1982 after the killing of Dr. Rodney, under the hand of the said registrar dated as well, 2014-1104, which showed at entry in 87, the child was born on 5th June 1946 at 17 Bar Street Kitty, not public hospital Georgetown, whose given names, not name, at birth were Cyril Milton, not William, father's name given as Cecil Adolph Johnson, not Cecil Smith, mother's name given as Anita Johnson Nee Simpson, not Anita Smith Nee Berry. Starting with the appendices in the book Assassination Cry of a Failed Revolution by William Gregory Smith and his sister Anne R. Wagner, the alleged birth certificate of Cyril Milton Johnson corresponds to that set out at 2 above. The birth certificate of the second page of the appendices corresponds to that set out at 1 above. 
the completed application form for a Guinean passport dated December 17, 1975, followed the particular set out with a height of 5 feet 8 inches, which was assigned by William Smith and had a copy of his photograph thereon and his occupation was given to that of an electronic technician. This passport was issued in the name of William Smith. The completed application form for a Guyana passport followed the particulars set out under two above, which was unsigned by the applicant Gregory Smith, and has a copy of Gregory Smith's photograph thereon, but this time his date of birth was stated as June 5th, 1945, not June 5th, 1946, and his occupation was changed thereof to that of Carpenter, not an electronic technician, and his height had increased to 5 feet 9 inches, although he was much older. This was the form that was approved by Mr. Larry Lewis on May 21st, 1999, and the Guyana passport was issued in the name of Cyril Milton Johnson. A copy of the passport, number 0890057, was issued under the name of Cyril Milton Johnson. The copy of the passport on the third page of the appendices of the book over the byline passport Cyril Johnson provided by the WPA is a copy of a previous passport issued to Gregory Smith. The knowledge of the police about Gregory Smith's involvement in the killing of Walter, as borne by the evidence of ASP McRae and refusing to act, and the acceptance by Senior Superintendent James that the police investigation was unprofessional. The combination of these unassailable facts and circumstances point irresistibly to official involvement in the removal of all traces of Gregory Smith and persons closely connected to him prior and subsequently to the killing of Dr. Rodney. These in turn point to a conspiracy and collaboration in the killing of Dr. Walter Rodney by, between or among the state officials, the GDF, the GDF and Gregory Smith. Additionally, when considering along all the pieces of evidence in determining who was responsible for killing Dr. Rodney, it is clear that the police had actual possession of the post-mortem report dated June 30, 1980 from Dr. H. R. M. Johnson, an investigative report dated July 23, 1980 from Dr. Frank Scus. These reports point to the involvement of Gregory Smith in the death of Dr. Walter Rodney. It is therefore difficult to understand why the police took no active steps to find or apprehend Gregory Smith, apart from the police posting on its wanted men board that Gregory Smith was a wanted person. In fact, at Dr. Rodney's inquest, when Mr. Jainarine Singh, attorney at law, was cross-examining Senior Superintendent Gentle, Counsel asked him when he went with a party of policemen to search the premises at Lord Forty Russell Street, Charlestown, Georgetown, where Gwendolyn Jones lived, whether he was looking for Gregory Smith. Mr. Gentle amazingly answered, at that time, no. That prompted counsel to ask him the further question, whether he was saying up to this day, February 10, 1988, his investigations did not show that Gregory Smith resided there at Forty Russell Street. And his answer was, my investigation did not include looking for Gregory Smith. On this evidence, Mr. Vernon Gentle and the police were clearly implicated in the conspiracy to conceal and distort the truth relating to the killing of Dr. Walter Rodney and events immediately following his death. The turn of distortion and concealment did not stop with Senior Superintendent Gentle. It transcended or infected the highest echelon of the GPF. As examples, we quote certain statements made by certain police officers. A. At the trial of Donald Rodney for being in possession of explosive without lawful authority before Magistrate Norma Jackman, Deputy Superintendent Ignatius McRae, being sworn on 11th February 1982, stated as follows. I do not know that Gregory Smith had a girlfriend working at the Ministry of Health. I do not know that if immediately after the incident... She was transferred to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I do not know that she lived at Rheinveld. I do not know if she was subsequently posted to the Guyana High Commission in Canada. 
During investigation, I might have heard the name Gwendolyn Jones. I do not know that she had several children for Gregory Smith. I heard that Gwendolyn Jones was interrogated by the police, and I do not know if she gave a statement. I do not know who interrogated Gwendolyn Jones. I do not know where Gwendolyn Jones is now. What I have told the court about Jones is true. On one occasion, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Cecil Skip Roberts, the Deputy Crime Chief, who had supervision and control of the investigation, according to Mr. McCray, called all members of the investigation team for a consultation, end quote. The above statements, except the last part, were clearly untruthful because on the basis of what we have set out above. At the same trial, see page 5 of ARG4, Mr. McCray, in answer in cross-examination to Mr. Dugnot Singh, attorney at law said, open quote, I would not recognize the handbook WPA was circulated among the members of the Guyana Police Force. I have seen a copy of this book. I know that this booklet has been published, but I do not know that it was circulated among the security forces. And as the booklet sets out, it is a guide to personnel of the WPA. The first paragraph is of Rodney, Rupnarain, and Omawali. I know that these three leaders were charged for arson of a building in Cam Street. I do not know the building is the office of the General Secretary of the People's National Congress, but I know it is the Ministry of National Development." End quote. The above statements by Mr. McCray were inaccurate or untruthful because of fact such that judicial notice can be taken from them that the raison d'etre for the recognition handbook was to assist the police in their surveillance of the members leaders of the WPA and it had been established that the building in Cam Street had housed both the Ministry of National Development and the Office of the General Secretary of the People's National Congress. Significant Findings In the end, it is clear to us that the police were unprofessional, extremely inefficient in turning a blind eye to the obvious, or deliberately botched the investigation in Dr. Rodney's killing, or were complicit with others, including the GDF, in hiding or shielding Gregory Smith from facing the brunt of the law for having murdered Dr. Walter Rodney. Given all the relevant facts, events, and circumstances set out in the report, we unhesitatingly conclude that Gregory Smith was not acting alone, but had active and full support, participation, and encouragement of, and or was aided and abetted by the GPF, the GDF, agencies of the state, and the political directorate in the killing of Dr. Walter Rodney. Dr. Walter Rodney was a man of large and significant stature, both in Guyana and beyond at the time of his death. He could only have been killed in what we find to be a state-organized assassination with the knowledge of Prime Minister Burnham in the Guyana of that period. It was a controlled society and Burnham had a large and detailed knowledge of whatever was being done by the state and its agencies. Mr. Laurie Lewis, then head of Special Branch and later Commissioner of Police, is dead. We find, however, that there is prima facie evidence that he, along with Major General Norman McLean, retired, then Chief of Staff of the GDF, and Mr. Cecil Skip Roberts, the Deputy Commissioner of Police and Crime Chief, had significant roles to play in the conspiracy to kill Dr. Walter Rodney and the subsequent attempt to conceal the circumstances surrounding his death. Further, given the manner in which the country was run, coupled with the threats issued by Prime Minister Burnham to the members of the WPA and the evidence of Mr. Robert Allen Gates, we conclude that Prime Minister Burnham knew of the plan and was part of the conspiracy to assassinate Dr. Walter Rodney. We have relied, too, on the evidence of Robert Allen Gates and on the relevant circumstances and events described in the report for that finding. We have relied, too, on the finding of Robert Allen Gates and on the relevant circumstances and events described in the report for that finding. Resulting from the premature termination, the commission, none of those alive and herein identified, was given the opportunity to testify and to resist this finding. The result is that we make no firm and specific determination 
concerning their roles beyond what is indicated herein.